Welcome back to Get to the Heart. I'm Bailey Mullins. In front of me is our co-host, Michael Weidman. Dude, we're still... I don't know. I feel like the tone is a little bit different for this episode. Yeah. But still lots of gratitude, but more of like... Even today, just thinking about how much we need Jesus, how much we need to seek his presence, how much we need to seek prayer. And so today I've asked... Michael to read a couple of the chapters or the devotionals yeah, from entries, maybe. Yeah, Those Who Sow. Uh, it's a devotional that we made um, through something we started called Agape Force Publishing. And a lot of our friends have wrote different, really powerful little entries to this book. And so we just kind of wanted to start out. Today's episode's about seeking the Lord and um, just being filled by his presence, filled by and consumed by his spirit. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, maybe I'll preface just a little bit. Well, one, um, here we go, hand bound by our staff team. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was it was a long road. Um, if you if you love it, we're almost out. So don't love it too much. You can't, you know, don't get covetous, but. There, there, there will be more to come in, in much later days. Uh, but, um, I think, um, I think it really started for me, like the, the thinking about this topic Mm. is, um, earlier this week, a friend of ours, um, well, I guess later last week, a friend of ours was filled with the spirit. He had been, um, uh, Oh, I just watched that happen. Um, a friend of ours had been filled with the Spirit for the first time. And uh, I shared the story of what happened, and and he's been just, a, I mean, I've jokingly said he's a ministry machine. Like, he's <laughs> off to the races. But, I mean, actually, JT summarized it best as he was like, when you look at Pentecost, mm. what happened at Pentecost? these guys praying together, gathering together, like loving each other. And then all of a sudden they come out of that room boldly preaching. Like what happened to them in that room was not something they decided. It was not a, it was not anything that you could attribute to um, psychology or it like something happened to them in that room. And, and I see that with our friend. It was like, it was like two years of, teaching and instruction and and being with him and like information that all of a sudden became alive and real and focused and hmm. and an overwhelming hunger for God. And so it ha- like like watching him and I was like thanks the Lord like he got filled with the spirit. That's cool. But then really it's like for me it feels like readjusting what it means to be filled with the spirit yeah. because he is unlike anything you know like to see the person that he was and to it's like is i mean he got born again like yeah. <laughs> it's he's it is a different person it is like pentecost so the bible says that the spirit is given for boldness to witness and and preach the gospel yeah boldness to witness to people i'm sure quite a few of our listeners are familiar with the book of acts And what happened on Pentecost, but do you want to kind of break down that particular scenario in Pentecost and what happened? Um, I mean, short, I mean, quickly, (laughs) I just think maybe, um, Jesus. So this is, so, uh, Luke, the, the guy wrote the book of Acts, also wrote a gospel attributed to him, Luke, um, at the end of the book of Luke, Jesus tells his apostles, um, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and don't try to do anything. He says like, you got to preach, you got to tell this message to everybody, but don't do any of that. Don't try to do anything until uh, I've sent you. uh, And then the, the words in the words that he uses is you will receive power from on high, Mm. which incidentally is the title of an incredible book by Charles Finney, power from on high. You will receive power from on high and don't do a thing until that comes. And so 
and even in the opening chapter of Acts, so that's the very close of Luke, and then the opening chapter of Acts, even in the opening chapter of Acts, you're kind of like looking at the apostles like, is anything different about these guys? Like what, what makes them all of a sudden ready to be, what, what makes them ready to change the world? What yeah. makes them world changers that they weren't a chapter ago? What causes this message, this particular message, to travel all over the face of the world and become the most well, popular message. So maybe like, yeah, you see that from this. Now you do. Yeah, yeah. if maybe like, let's let's just imagine, you know absolutely nothing about the story of Acts, but you know that Christianity is a worldwide phenomenon with a billion professing followers. And you go, you read the Gospel of Luke and you're like, okay, what was supposed to turn these, I mean, quite frankly, like kind of, losers a little bit yeah yeah like just regular laymen just regular guys what turns these guys into the people that start a movement that now encompasses a billion people and because we don't do that nowadays we're like let's get the most skilled people the best resume the the best uh you know degrees in theology and everything and if we put all these people in one room then we're gonna and and jesus is like i don't I don't need all these scholars. Yeah. You know, and then went to these lowly men, fishermen, different tax collector, whatever, and said, come and follow me. Gave them an opportunity to follow the yeah. Messiah and, or follow a rabbi, and which was a great honor at the time to be able to have that opportunity. Not everybody had that. And so, and you're thinking like, okay, is it just being with Jesus and now they've been with Jesus for three and a half years? Is that what's supposed to happen? But in Luke, Jesus makes clear, like, nope, still don't even try to do anything. Don't preach, don't do anything until you've received power from on high. And you're, and like, so you're thinking, you're like, okay, like, so what they need is power. What they need is some ability that is coming from outside themselves. And then Mm. sure enough, the, um, in Acts 2, they're all waiting, they're all praying together, and the Holy Spirit comes. And And throughout the book of Acts, it uses a bunch of different phrases, like filled with the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit came upon them, mm-hmm. uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit, all those different phrases to describe this phenomenon that happened to them, and it and it happened to them and in, in an instant. So you're like, okay, they spent three and a half years with Jesus, something about, like, they must have been growing and sort of you know what i mean like you look at the last couple chapters of john like john 14 to 16 like jesus is is really describing like there's been a relationship that has grown and and we've and there's been some maturity that's happened over these years but even like all of that it wasn't three years of growth it was a moment Mm -hmm. it was a moment of pentecost when the holy spirit came and when they received the holy spirit everything was different that's that is the evidence of acts 2 and what I like, what I've witnessed with our friend is basically that mm. it's like two years of instruction, of being with him, of like te- of teaching, of all this stuff. And like, there has been growth and there's been a lot of maturity, but like in a moment, in a moment, everything is different. Mm. And just listening to him talk, just being around him, watching him minister has made me so hungry for God. <laughs> when you watch somebody who is frank, honest, like no cover on their heart, Mm. just talking about their desperation for the Lord and how badly they want to see God move and the kinds of things that are happening in his life over the past week and a half. It's like, I need to get a hold of God. Like he's gotten a hold of God. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, is there anything you want to... I I don't know if this is appropriate to even bring up, but... uh, formerly from a secular Buddhist background. Yeah. Which is kind of nuts to me. Then going through this repentive process of discipleship and learning what it means to follow God, who is Jesus, what is he like, how do I draw near to him, and then finally coming to this point of almost like I'm just, it's a preparation of the heart. I'm ready to take that next step to actually be emboldened in power to, to make more disciples. So the thing about the, the thing that was great about my conversation with JT was 
when it was like he helped me see it was like yeah those three years with jesus the disciples three years with jesus wasn't for nothing Mm. like but in that moment all this stuff that was scattered and maybe just in their mind like coalesced into something that was real in their heart and exploded i mean that's a fitting term because when jesus says power from on high that word in the greek is where we get our word dynamite Mm. like it's dunamis yeah and so it really exploded in their heart and all this stuff and so i I, and i saw the same thing so to put it in perspective jesus was essentially a he was this he was a jewish rabbi who was essentially talking about an interpretation of the old testament and saying hey i'm the fulfillment of i am this messiah that you've been looking for yeah, he wasn't he wasn't always that straight up, but right, yes. right, totally. But essentially there was multiple sects of Judaism at the time. So the question is what explains that particular one spreading so much quicker and more abundantly oh, than sure. other rabbis followers. So, yeah, so eat like as a matter of history, yeah, as a matter of history, the fact that Jesus's followers did what they did is unexplainable. And even within the narrative, like when you look at those guys in the narrative of the story of the story itself, self-contained, it's like it's unexplainable. Aside from Luke says they received power from on high, the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit came on them, and so th- anyway, all of that to say, seeing that has made my friend, seeing my friend has made me just desperate for God. Yeah, just want to get a hold of him, and watching God move in his life, like. I think there's a there's like a holy jealousy. Yeah. It's like Lord, I want to be that. I want to have stuff happen. Like I want to yeah. be close to you. I want to. I want you to use me. I want. I want. I want that. And that's like, that's it. That's what's supposed to happen. I think. It's and like, it's it's hopeful because like even right now I am in a place where I'm broken before God once again. Where I'm, God, I just need to be on my face right now. I just I feel inadequate. But it's we don't have to come out of a place of uh, inadequacy or brokenness. Like God wants to empower us. We don't have to be ministering from a place of lack and being tired. Oh, you know, um, you do have to be broken to receive, but you don't have to stay broken. You know, you know what I mean. I I think I'm trying to. Yeah, you you don't have to be. The Christian walk isn't it, your own strength walk. Totally. Like God wants to empower you. God, there's a God that's there. Yeah. He's creator, all powerful. He's a Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person, which we'll get into with yeah, Sam's maybe. passage. Yeah. Who has been given to us to assist us in witnessing to others on behalf of the truth of reality. Okay, maybe I'm, maybe this is, tell me if I'm hearing you. Okay. I, I, I get the sense a lot of times, like in Christian culture, we're supposed to be humble. Mm. Like humility is, is step one to entering the kingdom at all. Um, but a lot of times it's kind of like, oh, I'm nothing. I can achieve nothing. I'm just so broken and so lame and so powerless and so... You know what I mean? Mm. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? But like, you don't totally. have to live that way. But what's so beautiful about watching our friend is like, he, when he goes like, no, it's all God. He means it. Yeah. He knows like I was broken, but now I've received power, and it's this beautiful thing where it's like his his life and his ministry are exploding. All of this crazy stuff is happening in his life. He like. This guy, like a guy got saved, he's going to baptize his first ever, you know, he's going to baptize somebody for the first time ever. All of this stuff is happening in his life. And it's like power, 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 power. But even in that, Mm. he's like, I know it's God. So it's this beautiful thing of like humility. There is the I need God, but it's not this weak thing where you're like, well, I'm just a broken person. I'm just a sinner who's forgiven. He's like, yeah. he's moving and the spirit is moving, but he knows it's the spirit and he knows it wouldn't have happened unless the spirit was helping him. 
Praise it's God. A, it's, a, it's an amazing thing what what the kingdom is like. You know, that's what the kingdom is. Anyway, should I read these? Yeah. And All right. Yeah. Can, can, yeah. Go. Go for it. I was just gonna say, but a outpouring of the Holy Spirit would be a bunch of people, individuals, experiencing that in a short amount of time period around each other. Well, that was Pentecost. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and 3,000 people got saved. Yeah. You know, so you're like, whoa, 3,000 people in one day, but when 120 people all got filled with the Spirit that way, that's what happened. 3,000 people got saved. And that's, so I think what, I think what, I'm, what we're saying is like, when you get hungry for God and God shows up and meets that hunger and gives himself and his power to you, 3,000 people get saved. Mm. Like that, that's what happens when God shows up. That wasn't, that wasn't just Pentecost. Like we can all have Pentecost. We can all see that happen if you're desperate enough. Because that's what happens when God shows up. When God shows up, stuff blows up. Yeah. Dynamite. Is part yeah. of it recognizing your need. Like you have to recognize that you are lacking, recognize that you do need help and power. Like you do need to be empowered in order to endure. Okay. We were, we had, we had, I'm going to, I'm going to get into it because we had this, we touched on this the other day when we mm. were talking. Um, you know, when you play the drums, it's not like hard mm. or like once you get into the groove, my mind usually like goes somewhere else and starts thinking about stuff while I'm just, it's funny, but anyway, and I was thinking about of all things. Okay. No, I was thinking about the chosen. Right. And I didn't want to watch season three for a long time. And I finally gave in and I was like, oh yeah, this is actually really good. And there's a part in there where Jesus is in the Nazareth synagogue and he's talking to the people and he says like, uh, he's talking about the year of Jubilee. He reads that passage from Isaiah. He says, it's the year of Jubilee. And he says, but I'm not talking about economic debt. I'm talking about spiritual debt. And the, the rabbi of the synagogue and the people, they're like, <clears throat> we don't have spiritual debt. We're God's people. And that's when Jesus, basically Jesus says like, until you're hungry, until you know that you have a spiritual debt and that you can't do this without actually meeting with God, as long as you're going to coast on being God's people, you won't ever get saved. Like you, you can think that you can be okay with where you're at, but until you get hungry, until you admit that you need more of God than you have right now, like I can't help you basically. I mean, really like I can't help you. And, but what's so amazing, what we miss a lot of times is that's what John the Baptist's ministry was. So you, you imagine this is the, this is the metaphor, basically. The Israelites are in the wilderness and God is leading them into the promised land and they all cross the Jordan River into the promised land. And then they're God's people. And then they get exiled and then they come back. And, but um, spiritually, and that and that's the metaphor that I think the baptism in the Jordan River is trying to aim at is physically you are God's people and physically you are back in the land, but spiritually we are far, far away from that from Joshua's generation that was working with God, that God was working in, that was taking the land. And like so that's what I'm saying is I'm repenting of my sins. And I'm saying, like, I need to come back to that place of hunger with, for God. I need to come back to that place. Spiritually, I know I am not Joshua's generation. And I can act like I am. We're here in the land. I'm a child of Abraham. I can say all these things that make it look nice. But I need to admit my sin before God and go and reenact a re-entry into the promised land. And so, and so not yeah. only is it saying, like, I'm spiritually empty and I need to return to God and have him give me his life again. There's a, I mean, it's looking at everyone else and saying like, you can play pretend, but I need to get a hold of God. 
You can play pretend like you're a child of Abraham and that's fine, but I need to get a hold of God. I need to become, I need to get back to the place where God was leading the children of Israel in those mm -hmm. days. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then Jesus picks that message right up and, and baptizes people in the Jordan as well mm. and, and becomes the fulfillment we read in Hebrews of the promised land is trusting in Jesus becomes what it means to enter the promised rest. Mm. Where did we, is there anything you want to say? I'd say open up the, all right, let's do the book. This is from, this is from Jacob Trim. Mm. He, he quotes, the Lord Jesus in dealing with men and women always approached them in such a way that of their own accord, they confessed their sin and need. Jesus does not force himself on anyone. In the Gospels, he is always giving people an opportunity to walk away. Yet to everyone, he stands at the door of our heart and knocks, exerting his influence and power to win us over inwardly and capture the attention of our hearts so that of our own accord, we will run after his beauty. I was talking about this with my friend some months ago, and afterward he said, I want to be drawn. What an incredible thing to say. And then I began reading the Song of Songs. And in the Bible's romance, the very same picture, the bride says to her love, draw me. Mm. I want to be drawn. I want the cold places of my heart to be awakened to love God. I want to be led into a deeper intimacy, ever and always initiated by him. No one comes to Jesus except the Father draws him. And thank God we don't have to initiate. We never would have. Mm. All we must do is respond to his knocking. Confess your need. You will instantly find him there to call you out of yourself and into himself. He won't force himself on you, but he is drawing you even now. Listener, do you have a heart that can hear it? Mm. Wow. I love I Jacob. just know, yeah, I love Jacob too. He, he spoke to me in a very important time. It was when I, it was the first semester of the internship still. And I was like, I'm misunderstood. Ah, you know, like freaking out. And cause you know, my idols were dying in my heart. These walls were being broken down. And so it really feels like that's the thing. If you want this kind of thing, if you want to meet with God, it's like, it's going to be painful. Yeah. Like there's a process. God's not going to make it painful, but it's the healing process. Like being in a cast kind of sucks, you know, when you got to heal <laughs> your good, leg. That's a good analogy. <laughs> um, but he spoke to me in a, in a very important time where my heart was definitely in rebellion towards people and i just couldn't see things rightly like i couldn't see people rightly i was trying my best but i had taught myself really how to be cynical my entire life because that's what the world teaches you develop cynicism so you don't have to feel hurt anymore but that what they don't tell you is you actually won't be able to feel love and yeah, have true, true relationships like that either but it is wonderful because i look back at my life especially throughout high school when i wasn't following the lord and i would come to these points of desperation and then i always go it's always the lord like even last night in that talk this psychologist that was atheist was talking about he's like for some reason even atheists like will Call out to God whenever they're scared. Oh, yeah. They, they believe in miracles. <laughs> if you remind them of their mortality, they, they suddenly report believing more strongly in miracles. Mm -hmm. That goes back to that principle, like the simple answer is always the truth. Like, how do you get close to God? You seek him and spend time with him. How do I get close to Michael? I say, hey, I want to hang out with you. Let's talk. Let me hear what you have to say. Yeah. I just remember when I learned that it transformed my life when I learned actually what abiding with the Lord looked like. Yeah. And I, well, really it started with just acknowledging that I wasn't doing it. Huh? Like I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm walking with God. I want to do this. I have these ambitions and my, yeah, I, I walk with God just like you. And then it's like, but do you hmm. like, do I, do, am I on my face praying for people? Do I actually have hope for people like my friends? I think we can mention one of our friends, Daniel Owen. 
he knows how to pray. He did a whole teaching on it the other day. And in the middle of the teaching, lays on the ground face down, seeking the Lord in that moment, because it is a practice. Well, okay, I just want to anyway. I just want to expound on that. Like our friend, he's like, "Let yeah. me show you," and he's just telling a story. Yeah. Like, "Let me show you the prayer that I prayed," and I, he's like, "I did this," and he gets down on his mm. face, and he's just laying prostrate in this room full of people, and there's like some giggles. It's like because yeah. he's he's like, he's like telling a story, and then he goes, "And then I prayed this prayer, oh God, give me a friend." But, and then all of a sudden, the entire room just shifts. Like, the shit. whole, the spirit of the whole room. And you realize in that, like right there. He's actually praying. He's actually praying. And he like, and you started, can hear him start yeah. to cry. And he's like, he's being moved. And, and I'm like, and I'm standing right there next to him. And like, mm. I'm starting to cry. And he, just the desperation for God that was like, I mean, he was hanging out. He was having a good time. It was, he was teaching. Mm. He was telling a funny story. And then all of a sudden, like. That was all the surface stuff, but right there, just right under the surface, what his heart really, where his heart really was at is in a place of desperation for God. Mm. And when, when everybody saw it, it, it shook people. It shook me, you know, and, and, but the same exact thing. I saw that and I went, I want that too. Mm. I want to pray that prayer. And that's why people, that that's why people say pray for tears, but it's not actually the tears you want. It's what causes the tears you want. Okay, so I this is a good segue into the next one because I feel like for maybe a lot of people listening, they're like, abide with God. Like, yeah. okay, I've been doing that. Like, I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been, what else do you want me to do? You want me to fast? You want me to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if I've been trying to abide, but I don't have this power, yeah. I'm not actually abiding. I'm not what, hearing from God. What more do you want me to do? And so now I'll read. This one is from this one is from Sam Eisenhower. Earlier this year, as I struggled to press into the Lord's presence one evening, I cried out, "God, I need your attitudes. I need your heart. I want more of you. Would you help me?" And then I'm going to skip over mm-hmm. a, a section of it, but basically he says, uh, "The Lord led him to read The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R.A. Torrey. Started reading the first chapter. I have it right here. And it's talking about how the Holy Spirit is a a person. Mm. And it has all these attributes of personality, like a mind, emotions, will, desire, things like that. Now I'll continue. Perhaps one of the most moving characteristics Torrey lists is the love of the Spirit. Insightfully, Torrey Torrey points out that the fact that the Holy Spirit deserves just as much attention for his saving activity as the father and son do he shares if it had not been for the love of the spirit seeking me out in my utter blindness and ruin to follow me day after day when i persistently turned a deaf ear to his pleadings until at last i listened and he opened my eyes to see my utter ruin and then revealed jesus to me i would be in hell today oh how the holy spirit deserves our gratitude As I read the chapter, soaking in every point, my heart was melted down in awe and tender admiration toward the person of the Spirit. Yet among all the thoughts presented, there was one that seemed to crown them all. Earlier in the evening, when I cried out for help from my numb heart, what I wanted, for help with my numb heart, what I wanted was more of the Spirit. But Tori rightfully reasons, if if he is a divine person with thoughts and a will, then the question is not, how can I have more of the Holy Spirit? So that's just comment there. All that, like, what do you want me to do? You want me to read my Bible more? Mm -hmm. I'm doing three chapters a day. You want me to do six chapters a day? What about 12 chapters a day? Do you want me to fast? Should I pray more? Try tears. What do you mean try tears? There's no tears coming. How can I have more of the Holy Spirit? All of that is works. Yeah. Like I'm trying to merit God coming and meeting me. Mm. I'm continuing with Sam. The question becomes, how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? If he is a divine person, the question is not, how can I get more of him? As if he were a thing I could have more of. If he's a person, the question is, how can he have more of me? To be full of the Spirit is to be fully possessed by him, as in he has ownership Mm -hmm. over you. To be sensitive and yielded to the heart and mind of a loving person. And then he records a prayer. Holy Spirit, I want to bow to you 
and walk with you and be possessed by you completely, be owned by you completely. Mm. Would you help me to treat you as a person today that mm. you would have more of me? Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's funny how the Holy Spirit, like you see evidence of the Holy Spirit all across Christian writing. Because you would assume, or it would seem like, people were copying each other. But even our friends be like, oh yeah, I was thinking about that this morning. And it's like this unified thing going on. Yep. But the Oswald Chamber is my utmost for his highest, which is like the most popular devotional that's ever existed. Literally says, don't seek an answer from God, but seek God who gives answers. Yep. You know, that's... So are you saying the problem is motive? I, okay, yes. Eh, yes, the problem could be motive. Is the problem motive? Yeah. Because, okay, so I have this. It's, this is actually the, the same book, though. Oh, that is the book that mm-hmm. Sam was reading. The person, the work of the Holy Spirit. Got and it. This part stuck out to me a few weeks ago. It says this, uh, so... Uh, let us settle it in our minds that God's guidance is clear guidance. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And any leading that is not perfectly clear is not from him. So, like, let's settle it now that if a leading you have is not perfectly clear and it's confusing and you're confused, you're not actually getting a hold. That's not how the Lord speaks. Yeah. To get to them. So could there be like wrong, there could be wrong motive, but there could also be something unsurrendered in your life that's keeping you from actually. Well, and even if you say that though, wrong motive is an unsurrendered, you know what I mean? Well, like we use, maybe use this analogy is like, how am I trying to get to my goal? I want to take this way. Like that motive is unsurrendered. Mm. Well, okay, it's better in a story. I was describing to somebody my, like, trying to get a hold of the Lord. And um, I remember uh, Sean Smith. Sean Smith mm. came to Texas a and he's like, he's like, Holy Spirit, man. <laughs> he'll be like, he'll be preaching, and he'll be like, stop. You know, 8675309. Like, who, that number means somebody to somebody. Mm. It's like, that's my husband's phone number. It's like, God's going to heal you of your migraines. Do you know what phone number that is? That yeah, I know. Quoted? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, It's deep in your subconscious <laughs> mind from that song. <laughs> um, I thought it would be better to not just make a number up. But anyway, oh, okay. so the... Um, what does that mean? That's Sean Smith. He's Holy Spirit man and all kinds of stuff happens. So I figured like, oh, yeah. Like if Sean Smith's here, like he's going to put his hands on me mm. and I'm going to like experience the Holy Spirit and I'm going to receive the gift of tongues and all this mir- miraculous stuff is going to happen through Sean Smith. Sure and I can be a part of the club. Okay. So <laughs> then, so then I like, I walk up and here's the thing is like, as I was walking to the front to receive prayer in my mind, I was like, I am going to get a hold of God. I'm going to get a hold of God. Like, I want this. I want Mm. God. I want more of him. I stood there, and Sean put his hands on me, and my small group leader, Colby Cates, put his hands on me. And in that moment, with the two of them there praying for me, it was like all of that motive that I came up with was gone, and I was like, I need to perform. I need to, Mm. I need to, like, now I have to speak in tongues because these guys are praying for the gift of tongues. And so if I don't, I'm not going to join the club. I'm going to be a loser. I'm screwed, man. Yeah. It's like, I have to, (laughs) do you know what I mean? And when that motive shifted, everything was gone. Nothing happened. Absolutely Mm. nothing happened. And I was like frustrated, desperately trying to muster up, like, please, you know, like, I'm here. Don't let these guys down. Like, I have to join the club. Don't, you know, and like the inner circle. Yes. And it didn't happen. And I said, there was, but, and I'm, I recently told this story to somebody and I said, but later when I did really get a hold of God, um, what I, I said, it was a weak, feeble attempt, but I knew that my, I had a single motive. 
And it was, God, I want more of you. God, I want more of you. And you are going to have to tell me, like a heavenly voice is going to have to come into the room and tell me, I'm not giving you any more because otherwise I will not be denied. Like I need to have more of God. And I said, it may have been imperfect. It may have been a little bit naive. It may have been a little bit childish, but I knew I wanted one thing. That other time, my motives were definitely mixed. And and I, you know what, let's not even call it mixed. By the time I got up there, I I had some other motive. But when I but when I had one motive, and that motive was to get a hold of God, he showed up. It makes me think of James where it's <clears throat> like you you don't receive because you you don't ask. And even when you ask, you don't receive because the motive is to use it on your own pleasures. You ask amiss to spend it on your lusts. Mm. That's the KJV. But I just yeah. paraphrase because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I have the heart of the actual scripture, but I'm like, <laughs> it works. Yeah, yeah, no, it totally works. I just, uh, I think something is so, well, that's why I, I like our <laughs> brains together because <laughs> there's just something so like rich about that exact phrasing. Mm. You ask amiss to spend on your lusts. You're like, well, no, I, you know, not my lusts. <laughs> just to be a part of the club. Nope. <laughs> you ask a miss. What's so bad about that, <laughs> man? <laughs> well, it's like, it's you're missing the point. Well, what Sam said is, like, how can how can God have more of me? You're missing the point. Mm. Is when you offer yourself to God, um, you're saying like, you deserve all of me. I want you to have all of me, like as a free will offering. I want to give you this. And this being myself, my heart, my will, my desire, my, I want to give you this. But if you say, I want to get, I want to give, God will meet you. I want to get, fill in the blank, nothing. It's kind of funny because that's the same thing that happens with generosity. It's almost always like, oh, I need, I need, so I can't, I need to consume, like I need to hold back from my generosity because I'm in need right now. Mm -hmm. But you look at someone like Jonathan who whenever he has a supporter fall off, he like gives that exact amount to someone else Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. faith that God's going to do what he said he was going to do in the scripture, which is bless a generous giver. Do we actually believe that? And that's what, when I first started the internship, I kept getting confronted with. Do I actually believe First off, that God wants to provide every need that I have, and I can't outgive God. Because I kept saying that. I'm like, you can't outgive God. And yeah. then it's like, oh, yeah. the Lord's like, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> your actual <laughs> bank account money where your mouth is. And, but I'll tell you this, personal testimony, take what, whatever you know, value it is to you. He's provided can I share a testimony? Yeah. I mean, literally, I, our friend asked me to do a t-shirt project for him. And before I even started the project, I, I, I heard the Lord ask me, like, all the money you make from this project, you don't need it. You don't need it in your bank account. I want you to give it away to someone else's summer discipleship project trip. And I was like, well, you know, I could probably use that. And, but I just said, yes, Lord. All right. I'm going to give it away. And there's this guy Okay, there's this guy that I was praying for, and I was like, I was like, Lord, like I want him to give. I want him to give to our trip. Mm. And he texted me, and he goes, God spoke to me at church today <laughs> that you guys are going to do something big. You're going to need a lot of money, so I'm going to give. And I was like, Bro, yeah, we Dang. we're going to Japan, so we're so we need. And um, then he uh, and then it's like radio silence for a month and a half, and he never gave that money. And I was like praying and thinking and like, I need a button. Lord, should I talk to him? Like, should I call him? Should I whatever? And then I did that t-shirt project for our friend. He gave me the money and I gave it all away. Mm-hmm. And it was like the next day or two days later, Boom. that guy who had, who was radio silence from, I was just thinking about him and I was like, Lord, should I reach out? Like, what should I do? And then it just showed up, showed mm-hmm. up in our account. And I was mm-hmm. like, thank you, God. But it all happened. Like when the release of obedience came, then the gift came. Like, oh, well, to bring it all the way back, when I had a spirit of give instead of get, when I said, yes, Lord, you're going to take care of me, I'm going to give 
instead of think about what I need. I'm going to think about somebody else's needs and take care of them instead of think about what I need. God took care of me. Mm. When my heart shifted to be unselfish, like God was, God had my back. And that's what it means to actually have a biblical worldview. Explain. Like to actually be kingdom minded. Like if, if you're a follower of Jesus, a Christian, like we're kind of going back to the first episode. <laughs> like what does it mean to actually be a follower of Jesus? It's you actually believe in what the Bible says. The power of someone can be rose from the dead. I believe that. <laughs> you know, God. You kind of smirk, but even that makes me feel bad to be like, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, someone could, yeah. And well, the truth is that there is a coming day when yeah, all who have died will raise from the dead, which is our the hope, right? Yeah, because we don't want to die. Um, but <clears throat> just like the generous giver thing, it's like to live a kingdom generosity worldview and life. I say, oh yeah, I have faith in God. I follow Jesus. It's like, but I, I don't actually believe he'll provide for me. Mm. I believe I have to do that all on my own strength. What you're actually doing is adopting an American mindset mm. of like the virtue. This is something we can kind of break down maybe a little bit. The virtue of independence. Oh, This idea, it's not actually a virtue, but it very much is treated like that in the United States yeah. where it's good to be independent. Uh, that's a virtue almost to not have to rely on anyone else to be completely self-sustainable. And I think about this and, and, I, and there's Christians who believe this and I'm not saying working hard is bad, but when I look at Genesis, it seems like that's why we're in this predicament to begin with. Oh, the self. Yeah. Self-made. Anyway, that was kind of a... <laughs> well, okay. Actually, so to bring it back, how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? Mm. Um, I think about our friend. He's watching God move in his life. But let's say, and this is great because I had, I was talking with him in front of someone else and he was telling me, so he, somebody in his life got radically right with the Lord. I mean, it was like night and day, boom, power of the Holy Spirit, no other explanation. But he told me he had to go up to them. Well, one, like part of that conversation was he cried in public. Like this, like during their conversation, he just started crying in public. And I was there. I watched it. It was awkward <laughs> for me, like to just and I don't know, you know, and he's my friend, and I don't know who else was looking, watching him just just cry openly in public. So there's that. And then on top of that, like, he confronted this guy. And he was like, listen, man, I don't think you're right with the Lord. And he's like, no, no, I gave my heart to God. He's like, no, I don't think that you're right with God. Like, you need to give your life to God. And this this guy had been lying to him continuously. Yeah, well. So that's so, just something Well, so he, like, yeah, my friend... Like that's evidence knew, of not. My friend yeah. knew that something was wrong in his heart from their conversation where he cried. He knew that something was wrong in his heart, but he had the boldness to go and confront him about it. So he's telling me this story in front of my other friend. And my other friend is like, man, I, I, like, I wish I had the boldness to do something like that. But I think that part of um, can, how can God have more of me? It's like, okay. If you want to be closer to God, are you prepared to cry in public, confront other people directly, tell them they're not right with God, like moving on, standing on the voice of the Holy Spirit and moving and acting with him in ways that are totally foreign to you right now, in ways that make you feel uncomfortable, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Giving money you don't think you have, all of these things that are kingdom principles is like, are you... If you want more of God, are you ready to move and have your life be transformed when he starts moving in it? Wow. When God starts moving in it, it's not like, thanks God for more money. It's like, thanks God I get to give this money away and then watch you perform a miracle. Mm. 
you know what I mean? It's not like, thanks God for the promotion. It's like, thanks God I got to confront my coworker about. Well, yeah, and it's it's really not all this intense thing either. Totally. Part of it is... My friend is in perfect peace. Yeah, exactly. And that's the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's, yeah. it's better to not have to take care of your whole life on your own. You're not even designed to carry that kind of burden. That's why you see people like literally get hunchback, cruel, cruel over. Like you, you see faces just become something other because they're holding on to all of this stress, all of this anxiety, all of these rights and, and attitudes and resentment. And it's like, there's a better way. And that's, you know, in the, the early church, the way. And I think that we, if you haven't heard us talk about careless, awakened, convicted, converted, mm. um, that's a whole talk. Do you want to break it down? No. Okay. <laughs> but just to use that Maybe framework next without breaking it, without breaking it down, but just to use the framework and say like, at a certain point, even when you're lost, you're like, I would like to get close to God. I think like, yeah, I, I want to be a, I want to be a good person. I want to go to church. Like I, I know that I need to clean my life up. I know mm. that I want to, you know I mean? There's an awakened stage. And I think even in Christians, like people that are following the Lord, it's like, I want to be used by God. Mm. I want to have more of God. I want to have a prayer life. I want to have understanding of the scriptures. And that's cool. And that's right. Is like, I do want more. I do want more of God. But Pentecost is not just like cool. Like there's, there's a road for James, mm. for James Zebedee, um, the brother of John, the road that Pentecost took him down led him to, to the cross, yeah. led him to death. Like all the, all the craziness that got born in, Jer- in the city of Jerusalem from Pentecost, all the hubbub, all the, all the stirring that the Holy Spirit was doing in that city led for James to the cross mm. and, and ultimately Peter and the rest, you know, mm. to different martyrs' deaths. So, like, and even in a personal life is like, Charles Finney will talk a lot about like self-denial, like th- one of the main principles of the Christian life being self-denial, mm. just saying no to what I want to do right now. And even in that, even in what seems to be that little thing is like, no, I don't want to watch this TV show. I don't want an extra hour of sleep. What I want is God and denying myself and saying what I actually want is more of him and would i give a piece of myself not just to have him but would i give a piece of myself away to him yeah to have it and the question is do we believe that's possible or do we believe that he'll show up yeah (laughs) because that's what the uh, eternity in their hearts was saying is uh, the the most basic reason potentially for prayerlessness or lack of seeking oh you mean um Oh, destined for the throne. Destined for the throne. Thank you. I'll just read it real fast because it's so good. But why is the prayer activity of the church so sadly neglected? What is the reason for the church's prayerlessness? Many reasons could be suggested, but perhaps the most basic one is lack of faith in the integrity of God's word. If the church were fully convinced of the fulfillment of the promises, such as, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Prayer would be the main business of her life. Well, and we, so earlier, even earlier today, we were talking about this. Like, um, the two of us and and our friend Cole, like, sitting on the bench and Mm -hmm. saying, like, you know, there are times when I, do have this spirit of prayer and I have yeah. times of prayer and God shows up and stuff happens. And like, I know that I'm full of the spirit and I'm moving and seeing things happen in my life. And then, but going back to that place, not just of saying like, what I want is activity for God, but what I really want is just to be with God. And when I'm there trusting him that he'll move 
And like mm. thinking that the activity for God is like, well, I'll just keep doing things for God and that'll just keep on. Like I'll keep being effective for God, but it wasn't ever about the activity. It was about being with him at the start. That was the genesis of all the things that were birthed mm. from that moment of intimacy and from that moment of prayer. All that activity came out of that. And thinking that the activity can just go on, like, thank you, God, I've been brought into this new season of fruitfulness. Like, no, the season was born out of the intimacy. And if it's and if you don't stay there or you don't go back to there, mm-hmm. all the activity will either get out of control yeah. and need to be pruned or it'll just die. Yeah, I've been thinking and, and feeling that way because definitely I want to press in further right now. And I, I feel like I just came out of a place where it's like, I'm on fire for God. Like, there's all these things happening. This this thing, this happened in small group. And like, then even today, I'm just like, I haven't really met with you like I want to. Like, I know my soul needs, like I want, I need a touch from my father. Like, I need to be in your presence. I need to come into your study. Um, I forget what I was going to say. I'm hungry for God. <laughs> there was a there was a point. Anyway, I was thinking of the church. I don't know. Like, I mean, that's kind of like, a, what's the last church? It's an L. Do you remember? Laodicea. Laodicea. I knew Michael would remember. <laughs> Laodicea. Hmm. Activity. Big money. Mm-hmm. Big shows. And I think even though, like, <laughs> I remember, you can be like, you can be like, oh, yeah, like the mega church. But I think even Bible studies that are prayerless or prayer meetings mm-hmm. that are prayerless, God forbid, but <laughs> it happens. Um, small groups that are prayerless. Like, there's a lot of discipleship that is prayerless. There's a lot of activity that you can do and think like, well, it worked at Sam Houston. We'll just do, do, we'll like be bros. We'll have the fellowship that mm-hmm. they had. But like, you can't replicate, you can't replicate intimacy with God without, you can't replicate what was born out of intimacy with God without your own walk with God. And I think that that like, what's so awesome about watching Daniel, watching our friend is like, is it's not the activity that's impressing me. When I actually get to talk with him and I see his heart, when I see both of their heart and their desire is, is and they're open and honest about the source of all this activity and power. It's like, I got close to God. And, I, and so I see through like the activity that's awesome, but I know that the activity is born out of the intimacy. Mm. And that's where I wanna go. I wanna go back to the place where I'm actually just mm. with God for his own sake, not for the sake of the activity, not for the yeah. sake of the fruitfulness, but for his own sake, because I know that he's lovely, that he's wonderful, that I just mm. want to be with him. And, and this re- recognition of a need to meet with him, like <clears throat> there, I think the overwhelming is like, I want to meet with you, God. But there's also this like reality of like, if I don't, I'm I'm dead. I'm not a, a minister at all i'm not a because of the almost like if you stay in the same place it's almost like there's no you're actually falling behind this like stagnating like staying in one place is actually mm-hmm. backsliding in a sense yeah because of the infinite parabola that is god parabola is that the right word you know the the chart where it just like approaches zero oh infinitely that's that's exponents no. I'm looking at Michael again. <laughs> Exponents. La- ah, I knew I could trust him. Um, maybe, maybe we'll end with this. Yeah. Um, at the very end, there's this whole book, incredible book. Please, if you're listening, get this book. Change the way I minister. Change the way I evangelize. It's called The Dynamic of Service by hmm. Paget Wilkes. He's a... Uh, uh, missionary to Japan, which is part of why it's so valuable is because he's like, you know, he's like, yeah, Charles Finney, John Wesley, love those guys. He's like, but they can do things preaching to people with a gospel understanding 
like mm. a foundation of a gospel understanding that I cannot do in Japan. So he's talking about not just evangelism, but like cold from absolutely zero knowledge about God evangelism. So it's really wonderful perspective. Um, at the end of the book, he like does this whole book about evangelism, which is like full of awesome nuggets and, and stuff that I learned and the Lord taught me a, a great deal. But at the very end, he's like, so anyway, it would be pointless to go through all of this without saying that it's all useless without prayer and being mm-hmm. filled with the spirit. And then, and then this is the key line that has, ne- that has never left me. He goes, so many ministers want to get a hold of God because, um, they want to be used by God. Mm. And he goes, but to seek God to be used is the wrong thing. And so this is the line. He goes, so many people pray, God, um, I want to be used by you. He says, but the right prayer is to pray, God, would you make me useful? Mm. Like come and change my heart so that I'm useful to you. Not just that me in my present state, I'm used would you come and meet with me in such a way that I'm changed and made useful to your work? And that place of humility, I mean, the reason why it's stuck with me so much is because it always checks my motives at the door. Mm. When I come to meet with God and, and I start to cry out like, I want my small group to do well. Mm. I want my company to do well. I want to have something to say. I, want, I, need, I need to meet with you so that I can go do something else better. Like it always checks my motives at the door where it's like, God, I want to meet with you because you have something that you want to do in me. And I want to let you have all of it and let you do that work that you're preparing to do in me. Thoughts? You're you're, (laughs) You're ministering to me right now. I'm like, my heart's convicted. I'm just like, I need to meet with God. Uh, Like that's what I feel like. Um, So that's, is that how we do it? Like, there's, it's just, it's as simple as that. It's like having the right motive and saying, God, I want to be your friend. I don't want to just be used by you. I don't want to be a part of the club. I don't want to be this great Christian evangelist. It's like, God, help me love the people that are in front of me. Help me love you well. Yeah. Okay. And that's why I go to the prayer closet. That's why I get on my face. It's like, I'm desperate. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to love people well. Right now, I'm not loving people well. Right now, I'm not loving you well. Right now, I don't have good motive. So, talking again about our friend, he, somebody was like, yeah, I was talking to him. And he said, I learned that day that we're saved by grace. And like, (laughs) he laughed. And then I kind of like, huh. And then I like thought about it. But I think that when it, when an abiding time, like a lone, quiet time, mm. has been spent trying to get from God. Do you know what I mean? But God wants to give. Well, already. God wants to give, but like, but that motive of get from Him. Yeah. Like we, we, <laughs> that thing that you read from uh, Destin for the Throne, like when you come to Him just with a spirit of give and you go, You're like, I've been trying to get from you and all I feel is dry. But now I come with a spirit of give and I do want you to show up, but I'm just here for you is when he meets you. And that like, that is say like you, we don't believe that if we would just come with the right motives, he would meet us and pour himself out. But even then, like, it's like, but I'm coming and I'm (laughs) with the spirit of get. Yes. And I, God, I have right motives. I think <laughs> I, but that right. C.S. Lewis, he says, um, is it wrong to come to God, uh, to like basically to experience him and to, mm. to be with him. And he goes like, that's like saying that it's wrong to get married, to spend the rest of your life with that person. Mm. It's like, that's not selfish. That's how love works. It's like you get married so that you can have one another. And it's like, do I want God to show up and to meet with me so that I can experience him? Like, yes, that's not selfish. That's how love works. Mm -hmm. Like love means that I give myself to you and you give yourself to me. And that's how it works. It's beautiful. That's why. Mm -hmm. But if I go, I'm coming to you to get, and you're coming to me to get, we'll both end up empty. 
But if I come to give, then we trust a God who is love to give himself back to us when we come with that right motive. Praise God. Got anything else? No. I'm just like, Hungry for I don't have anything to, to contribute right now, but I'm just thankful. Honestly, thankful for our friendship. Thankful for, uh, that we get to talk about this. Cause it's important to, for me, at least I know it doesn't really matter about the, Oh, this is a good tip or a good advice, or this is, you know, this is how I, work my way six ways to get closer to god yeah exactly i just know if i actually believe something i'm gonna do it mm. and take god at not word. when i'm thinking about it it's like over the last couple of days i haven't been spending a lot of time in prayer so i must not really believe i need it right now mm. because things were going really well and i think that's Good often word. what you were talking about is or on the on the swing when it was me you and cole it's like you get where it's like, I'm praying, I'm praying, and Holy Spirit's moving. And then it's like, it's still going for a while, but you'd stop praying. And then it's like, pfft, you're like, oh, wait. I forgot that this isn't about, the, the, the fruit, the outflow isn't yeah. the point. Yeah. The point is like, my heart's right. And it happens to be that when your heart is right, when you've, it sounds so funny, because I'm like, it happens to be, but... <laughs> It's like, it happens to be when you meet with the source of all life and power. Life and power comes. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I'm just like, I feel so silly. That's like why sometimes, maybe even like the debate last night, I was confused and it just kind of felt kind of silly. Because it's like, we're like, oh, we give humans so much credit. And it's like, first off, you're breathing oxygen. (laughs) You know, go in. <laughs> Second <laughs> off, it's like you 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 got fed and your butt wiped by your parents when you were young, and all these things, it, all these things had to come in the perfect position to for you to be able to deny God, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and be ungrateful, <laughs> yeah, and like pretend like your thoughts are original. <laughs> You know, you're, you know, anyway, and so that's how I feel right now. I'm just like, Lord, I just need to remember, like, what this conversation is reminding me of is just following God is simple. Mm -hmm. It's like, just stay close. Mm -hmm. Like, get close, stay close, continue to abide. And that's why I think people like James Tour. He's like, all my research, all the success I've had mm-hmm. comes from reading the Bible every day. And he, he doesn't even say reading. He's like meditating on the word, mm-hmm. which is the command, right? And he counts all his uh, nanobots and, and his origin of life research success all to like reading a sentence in the Bible and just sitting there and thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And that's why like, you know, you have so many pastors. Well, and it's a, you know, I seek you in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, get up. First thing you do, read your Bible. And in, in this, there's life. Like mm-hmm. in Jesus' words, in who he is in character, there's life. And the more I look at him, the more it reveals the parts of me that aren't like him. And when those things get revealed, like that happens in prayer. It's like, God, I've been ungrateful. Or God, I've had bad motive. But if we don't, step into the throne room, get on our face and walk in with humility saying, God, I need you today and I need you every day. Then the light won't reveal parts of our character that aren't conformed to him. Mm-hmm. And we'll end up in confusion. It's like what earlier up in that part of the up my utmost for his highest, it says like, if you're anxious or depressed, it's not God's fault and it's not anyone else's fault. It's your fault because there is something to do with it. Just do what deep down you know God is calling us all to do. And it's like, come before him, humble ourselves, yeah. receive what he has for us today. And like, really, I mean, I'm sure you know this as a father. It's like, 
the the thing that brings you the most joy is when your children are just like, oh, I yeah. want what you have for oh, me. Yeah. And so, dude, Michael, thanks for sharing this uh, this message Thank today you. and like having this conversation. And we both we both brought a brought a hunger that made this thing possible. Yeah. All right. So challenge for all of us okay. and everyone listening. We'll take Jacob's word and Sam. They both said the same thing, that God wants to meet with you more than you want to meet with him. Mm. And he will initiate. He will initiate that drawing. So I gave this challenge to my small group, and we'll just do it again. And for anybody listening, for the next week, I mean, it should be like for the next rest of your life, but, you know, uh, any time you sense God drawing you into prayer, like you get that check in your heart that's like, man, I need to pray. Like I want to be close to God. Just drop what you're doing and go meet with him hmm. and go take a walk or get in a prayer closet or open your Bible or whatever it is, whatever it is that you're going to do to meet with him. Just trust his drawing that if he says, like, I want to meet with you now, you just say, okay, now, and we, and just drop it and go and, and go meet with him and we'll see. What happens? See what happens. Yeah. I, I just remember when we did the prayer stream last year where we had the coffee air stream set up mm -hmm. and we had, I don't know, what is it? A whole month Something like of that. prayer. Things shifted. Things changed. Like there's real evidence of prayer and even in personal prayer, there's real evidence of those things. So it's like, seek and you shall find. Mm -hmm. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Like your father will satisfy. There's something for you there. And I'm going to go find it. Yeah. Do you want to pray? Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, um, both in our lives now and, and throughout history, God. We're so grateful for your truth, um, for the revelation of, of the gospel, the good news, Lord Jesus, that that you are conforming us to be like you so we can be fit for an eternity with you, God. So let us not neglect who you are and what you're like, Lord. Let us not neglect um, the assembly of fellowship with people, but but most of all, the fellowship with you, God, to, to get alone, God, to make it a priority. Lord Jesus, when we feel lacking, not to, to run from your presence or run to other things, but God, let us run towards you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for every single person listening to this, God, that that you will touch their lives with something in this episode, God. And, and, you, and you've touched our hearts today, so we thank you so much, and we're grateful um, for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you.